Matthew chapter 16. The word of God says, starting with verse 13, if you have it, say amen. Good stuff. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for trusting us with these text messages. We look forward to what you have to share with us this morning as you open up our hearts and our minds to see what you would have us to see, to know what you would have us to know, and to follow where you go. Thank you for this challenge. In Jesus' name, amen. Caesarea Philippi was an area that King Herod and even his grandson wanted to give in tribute to Caesar. Now, Herod's grandson, Philip, wanted it to be a little bit unique and, and have his own stamp of identity because there were a lot of cities and, and, and towns that were dedicated to Caesar. As you know, Caesar saw himself as a god. In fact, even one of his titles was son of God. And so here in Caesarea Philippi, you have a place that is dedicated to one who was called the son of God. The fact that any king of the Jews would dedicate an area, a temple to Caesar in and of itself is challenging to consider. But this is what was going on. This area was also very particular in the history of the Jews because there was apostasy that had happened in this area. This was at the base of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon was, was, was believed in the book of Enoch to be the place where fallen angels had decided to be with the wives of men. It's also where they worshiped, uh, the, the Jews apostatized and worshiped Baal. So it was notorious with being associated with those who had cut themselves off from God. Now in uh, the third century BC and into Jesus' time, the Greeks and the Romans had taken over this area and many temples had been erected to worship their gods. One god in particular, the god Pan. Most of you have seen the depiction of Pan. The depiction of Pan where half man, half goat, playing a little harp. And this god was focused on fertility. He wanted to bless people with many children. He wanted to bless their crops, their livestock. And so he was kind of a one-shop stop if you wanted to know the God's will for your life. But something happened here in Caesarea Philippi as you had kind of what I'd like to consider a mall of religious experiences. A mall where there were all kinds of gods you could talk to and connect with. Any, if you had car problems, there was a God there for you. If you had fertility issues, there was a God there for you. If you wanted to open up a Subway franchise and be blessed, there was a God there for you. Bestiality happened in this area. And so Jesus shows up at Caesarea Philippi. There's a reason why Matthew wants to make note of this region because this was the red light district of their day. People who loved the Lord, people who followed uh, God's teachings, Jews would never show up at this place. Never. And yet Jesus takes his 12 closest compadres to Caesarea Philippi. It is here at the base of this mountain, Mount Hermon, where there was an opening and uh, the river that came gushing out of this mouth 
this, of, of the mouth of the cavern there would, was one of the tributaries of the Jordan River. It would feed the Jordan River. But in the mouth of this cave, and I want to show you this picture, in the mouth of the cave, they called this the gate of hell. It is where they believed that the gods that were worshipped in this area would visit Hades. They would pass there and back. It is still in existence today, even though with an earthquake, the river no longer comes out of this mouth. There were people that would sacrifice their children in this cave. Live children they would toss into the mouth of this cave where the water resided. And, and, and by drowning their children, they believed the gods would bless them with more kids. It doesn't make sense. A lot of our religious experiences do not make sense. But again, this was a cesspool of sin, of idolatry, and all kinds of debauchery. And this is where Jesus chooses to ask this question, who do men say I am? Does this make a little bit more sense to you why Christ would choose this moment, this space, to ask the question, who do people say I am among the pantheon of gods that exist right now that people are praising and lifting up among all the sons of gods? Who do people say the son of man is? Who do they say I am? And of course, the disciples say, yeah, man, they, some, of you, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some people think that you're Elijah. Some people, Jeremiah. They think you're just a, a prophet. But who do you say I am? And this is critical. Because who they think Jesus is will determine their path. See, if Jesus is just a good teacher, just a rabbi, if Jesus is just a prophet, that's one thing. But if Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, then there's a different level of allegiance. And so here is where the question is asked, and here is the answer that is given. How many of you like Peter's answer? Good answer? I think it's a good answer, right? Up to this point, we've been focusing on the life of Peter. Up to this point, we see that Peter is the most outspoken of the disciples. He appears to get it right always at the beginning. He's the disciple that wants to get out of the boat and follow Jesus, showing his deep trust in Jesus' power to sustain even in the storm. Peter's the kid in, in class who's always raising his hand when the teacher asks a question. Me, me, me. And so Jesus asked the question, and here's Peter, Simon Peter. Me, me. Yes, Simon Peter in the back. You're the son of God. Ooh. Not just the Messiah, but the son of God. See, a Messiah could be just anybody. A Messiah is Samson. A Messiah is one of the judges in the book of Judges. Could be Gideon. A Messiah could be a prophet. All the Messiah, the name meant, is deliverer. Someone who could deliver God's people. There were many deliverers in the Old Testament. So just to be a Messiah is one thing. To be the son of God, that's divine. That's epic. That's next level. And Peter says, you are the son of God. Not just any Messiah. You're not John Maccabees in the Apocrypha. No, no, no. You are the son of God. You descended from heaven. We believe that you have power over the devil and his armies. We have seen enough evidence. Not only can you cast out demons, but you can calm the storms. Remember what I told you? They, they believed that, that, that the abode of evil was in the sea. This is the reason why Revelation says, in the end, there will be no more sea. Because they equated the sea with where Satan set up his army. That is why they believed that the gates of hell, this, this, this cavern that was full of water and water coming out, they believed if you swam deep enough, you would get to Hades. You would get to the place where evil resided. So Peter had seen enough. You are the son of God. And Jesus liked his response. 
Jesus' response in Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, he replies, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. And remember, that is Peter's name, Simon, and he's the son of Jonah. It is Jesus who called him Peter, which is, which is Petros. Simon, son of Jonah, yes, blessed are you, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. This is powerful because up to this point, Jesus was really hush-hush about Son of God talk. He was very hush-hush about Messiah talk. He didn't want people to, to see him as the Messiah because he believed it would change the way he ministered. It would impact people's understanding of what he was saying. Christ wanted to kind of slip in there and heal in, 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 in places and sometimes even tell people, don't tell them I healed you. The blind man's like, I think they're going to find out when I can see, but all right. Christ didn't want the extra noise. He didn't want that hype. He wanted to be able to teach about the kingdom of God without the distraction of Rome seeing him as a Messiah. Because you know what Rome did to Messiahs, right? Crucify him. Any person claiming to be a Messiah, Rome saw as a political and military threat. So Christ would always be very hush-hush about Messiah talk. Don't say anything. Keep it hush-hush. And you'll hear, you'll, you'll, we'll read here him even telling the disciples to keep it quiet. Blessed are you, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. I haven't even been talking to you about this kind of stuff. My Father in heaven has revealed this to you. So this is Peter, now a prophet. Peter, who is hearing from heaven directly. Peter, who the Holy Spirit is moving upon. Peter, who is a conduit of the message of truth and revelation. Peter, this is Simon Peter. He's the man. He gets the answer correct. And Jesus, Jesus commends him for it. And then he says these words, and I want us to focus on this for a little bit. He says, I tell you that you are Peter. You are Petros. You are Peter. You are Petros. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So question, when Christ says the gates of Hades will not overcome it, did he have an illustration right in front of him? He was looking at literally the gates of hell. He was looking at the opening of the cave where people believed that the gods would, would pass to and fro to Hades and back where no human being could go and come back alive. Anyone who went into that cave, anyone who went to that waters was a dead person. And Jesus says, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against them. Now, we need to have a little bit of a theological moment here. Because there have, been, there have been those that believe that this rock that Jesus is going to build his church on is none other than Peter himself. In English, it appears that Christ basically says, you are rocky. You are rock. And upon this rock, pointing to Peter, I'm going to build my church, the Catholic church has used this as support for having a pope, a representative of God here on earth, and that the pope has been given the power to change laws, change God's laws, change what we read in scripture, that he's been given that authority. The Catholic Church will tell you that Peter was the first pope, but that is not what the text is saying. First and foremost, we need to understand the Greek. Peter's name is Petros, but when Jesus says, I'm going to build my church upon this rock, the word he uses is Petra. Petra is a big rock. It is, it is like a bed, it is like a, a, a bedstone. It is, it is a cornerstone. It is a foundational rock. Petros means pebble, <laughs> means little stone. <laughs> So Christ would never look to Peter and say, you're a little stone, and upon you, I'm going to build my big church. Absolutely not. When you read it in the Greek, it's obvious. He's basically telling Peter, yes, you're a little rock, but upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. There are historians and archaeologists that will tell you there was a large rock that Christ was actually pointing to, saying, here in this bastion of evil, I'm going to set up my church right here on this rock. 
Those of you who have traveled to the Holy Land have, have, have most likely seen this rock and seen again the mouth of the cave, which is the gates of hell. There's another reason why we know that Peter is not the rock, not just grammatically, but contextually. This, the, the context of this passage isn't about who Peter is. The context of this passage is about who Jesus is, right? Who do you say I am? So when you look at the context of the passage, we know that we're not really talking about Peter. We're talking about Jesus. So contextually, we know this is not about Peter. Theologically, we know it's not about Peter because even Peter testifies of it. Oh, we don't have too much time to get into all of it. Even Paul testifies to it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, Paul says that no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, that's 1 Corinthians 3.11. Just make a note of it. Christ is the foundation. In Ephesians 2.20, Paul further explained that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone on which the church is founded by the apostles. And even Peter himself, who hears these words from Jesus, he knows he's not the stone. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he compares all the believers to small stones that are part of a superstructure of the church. Even Peter himself, he says in verse 4 of chapter 2, that Jesus is the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God. He even calls him a precious stone. Peter, in that same passage, he quotes Psalms and Isaiah where it talks about the cornerstone, the stone that the builders have rejected Peter even says this also in the book of Acts, chapter 4 and verse 11. He says, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which which became the chief cornerstone. So even Peter knows that Jesus is the rock. And this is really important here because, church family, we can never build our church on us. We can never build our church on who we are. Are. Why? Our foundation is always cracked. Can I be honest with you? Always cracked. Always. It's unstable. We're all unstable. Now, I'm not saying that ideas are not good. We can't have a good idea here and there. But if we are building our church on our own creativity, by our own intelligence, if we are attempting to build our church on our own experience, our own preferences, it will never ever be successful. It must always be built on the rock of ages. Somebody say amen. This is why we go to scripture. If you want to find out what the foundation should be, it should always be Jesus. I think strategies are important. I had a, I had a conversation with a pastor friend of mine this week talking about strategies and us going back and forth on, on what does it really mean to be a successful church and, and can God use strategies? Can he use uh, 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 what we are doing today, some of the best practices? Does God even need that in order to do what he's doing? I, that to me is not a debate for right now. What I want to focus on is what no matter what generation you're a part of, no matter what era you are in, no matter if you have technology or you do not have technology, whether this is the first century church or the last century church, Jesus will always be the foundation. This is what I'm saying here. I want to make sure you understand this, all right? No matter how flashy your, our colors are on our, on our social media, no matter how, how modern our designs may be, no matter if we are serving decaf in the lobby in order to attract people, no matter what we think we're doing, if we do not have Jesus as the foundation, nothing will last. And some of those foundational principles that is Jesus Christ is love. Long-suffering, patience, kindness, compassion, mercy. Every church that is successful and will last must have this as their foundation and identity. Every church that claims to follow Christ must have in its DNA the character of Christ. If not... No matter if you were able to build a megachurch overnight, it will not last. I've been been to a couple of churches that 
consider themselves mega churches or pattern after mega churches, you'd be surprised what happens behind the scenes. People who are hand selected to be in the front pew or the front seat so that they can they can show their excitement. Oh, you're a really you're a, you're a really enthusiastic worshiper. We want you in the front on camera. We want people to see that we're really excited about the gospel message. We want people to see that we're really on fire. Some of this stuff is so strategic. This is not about how we love one another. It's about camera angles and, and, and placement of people and, and, and how a band sounds. Even the worship music that is most popular today, you have no idea the amount of testing that goes on before this is a part of an album. Making sure that the music sounds good, it sounds right. Can you imagine the disciples before Pentecost that they were like in the upper room going like, yo, uh, this is how I think we should approach this first sermon. They went to the upper room because Jesus told them to go to the upper room, and he says, wait for the Holy Spirit to fall upon you. Once the Holy Spirit fell upon them, they didn't even know what they were going to say. They just went out there and they started preaching in tongues. Too often, too often, our foundation isn't Jesus Christ, and because it's not Jesus Christ, Everything that we do, anything that we do will not last. So Christ says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now I want to just talk about this for a little bit. Reason why we know, I told you grammatically, contextually, and theologically, we know that, that Peter is not the rock, but even historically, we know he's not the rock because the early church fathers never associated Peter with being the rock. This didn't happen until centuries, centuries, centuries later when the Catholic Church then made it a, a belief, part of their system. And the reason why this is so important is because we are always, always trying to shift where the power comes from. We are always trying to shift what the source of wisdom is. We are always trying to shift who is really in control. And this is why is we must understand who's in control and who is in power and who is leading and who is guiding. Because Christ says that if he is the foundation and he is the rock, he says the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I just want to establish this for a second because I think as a church and sometimes, dare I say, a denomination, we sometimes get this twisted. We, most of us, grew up in a church that was afraid of the end times afraid of the end times, afraid of what the enemy will do to us. I remember, I remember being told as a young boy that one day uh, me keeping the Sabbath might cost me my life or I'll be in prison one day because I keep the Sabbath. You know that. I know we don't preach that anymore, but you know how that, y'all know how you were raised, scared of the end times, frightened. Someone's going to come to you with, with a gun in the back of your head and say, do you keep the Sabbath? <laughs> I mean, yes, I mean, no. It was life and death. So we became more insulated. We, we created more programming so on Sabbath we could stay in the church. That way we would not sin. Yes, some of our programming is geared around keeping us from sinning. Because they didn't trust you going home with your own thoughts. Come back at 2 o'clock. We have more Bible study. Bible bowl, Right? So, 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 so we have insulated ourselves. We want to protect ourselves from the world, right? We're in the world, but we are not of the world. So we make sure we don't watch the wrong things. We don't listen to the wrong music. We don't hang out with the wrong people. We only focus on church folks and, and, and only hang out with church folks. We need to protect ourselves from the evil influence. We do not want the gates of Hades to get a hold of us. But Jesus has a different mission for the church. He doesn't see the church huddling in a corner asking for sanctuary. He doesn't see the church building gates to keep people out. He sees the church not on the defense. He sees the church on the offense. Gates are used to keep people out. Right? I mean, some like that they look pretty, but the point is they want to keep people out. I have gates up so that you cannot walk your dog onto my lawn and do his thing. Gates keep people away. 
And so Jesus says to his disciples, and you need to understand this because they got this very clearly. I am building my church right here in the red light district. Uh, what? Right here, I am building my church in Amsterdam in the red light district. And not even the gates of hell will prevail. Wait, 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 what? Wait, what? No, no. Let's build our church in a nice, quiet neighborhood like most Adventist churches, right? Let's build our camp in the wilderness, right? All our camps, Camp Cedar Falls, Camp, uh, 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 Pine Springs Ranch, most of our Adventist camps, you, it's hard to find it. Even Google doesn't know where they are. <laughs> we just want to be far from everywhere. We have seminars on how to live off the earth. If you only have dirt and rocks, this is how you can still live, right? All we're trying to do is get away. And Christ is like, I don't want you to get away. I want you to, to, to lead an assault on the gates of Hades. This place right here that you're afraid of, looking at bestiality and looking at all these other religions and child sacrifice, all this stuff that you are witnessing, I want my influence right here. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Because Jesus isn't afraid of the devil. Jesus ain't afraid of sin. Jesus ain't afraid of your dysfunction or your neighbor's dysfunction. Christ came because he knew you were a hot mess. That's why he came. And he believes that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So he's willing He's willing to put all his eggs in one basket. And this is what he tells Peter. He says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Only my heavenly father upon this rock speaking about himself, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Look at Matthew 16, 19 and 20. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. I told you we would read that. But listen to this, listen to this quote. Christ is the foundation, right? Christ is the foundation, the sure foundation, the cornerstone. But look at the authority that he gives Peter and the rest of the disciples. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Are you, are you reading that? Christ is saying, <clears throat> we're in collaboration with one another. Yes, I'm the foundation, but I'm going to work with you. I also want your creativity. I also want your experience. I also want your ingenuity. I also want your, your, uh, your intelligence. I also want to use your experiences. There's always been a partnership between God and man. Discipleship, following Jesus, doesn't mean we're simply robots and wherever Jesus goes, we simply follow and we never think for ourselves. He says, no, I work in collaboration with you. Peter, it matters what you think. John, it matters how you see things. James, it matters how you understand stuff. And so I want to share it in a way where we can always be collaborative. If you think I'm making this up, look no further than the Old Testament. How many times did God collaborate with man? How many times did, 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 did God, uh, when he's working with Moses, work with him? Moses told God, you better go with us. Don't you, don't you send us onto the promised land and not go with us yourself? And this doesn't mean that we're not going to sometimes have bad ideas because sometimes we will have bad ideas. If our foundation is Jesus, even when we have bad ideas, the church will not break. I need to say this part again. When Christ is our foundation and he's the rock, even when we have a moment where we say, I think we should invest $10,000 on, on steps to Christ that we're going to send out into the neighborhood. And let's say we get nothing from that. The church won't fall apart for that evangelistic effort. We're going to give out new Bibles. We're going to give out new Bibles for the entire city of Glendale. That may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
If the foundation is secure, you can deal with a broken window. You can deal with a door that's no longer settled because of an earthquake. You can deal with a countertop that's scratched. You can deal with some of the things that go wrong in houses. When the foundation is secure, the house will still not fall. What we have to make sure is that we are on the secure foundation, but continue to be creative in our endeavors. Continue to think outside the box. Continue to envision. We're about to have a, a yard sale. Sister Nina wants to have a yard sale on Friday. I told her we should have it on Sunday. She says, no, we're going to do it on Friday because I want to sleep in on Sunday. I said, well, now you're not going to be able to sleep in on Friday. She's like, this is when we're going to do it. I said, Sister Nina, this does not make any sense. I pleaded with her, and she said, Friday. And I said, Okay. So we're going to have like a Black Friday sale and we're going to have those of you who are retired come out and maybe some of you might want to get off work on that day because we're going to have some really good deals. But here, check this out. I'm okay with it. Let's try something new. I thought Sunday would work better. You know what? Friday may work better. We'll open up our patio for people to come and have lunch from the hospital. We can think outside the box. As long as Christ is the foundation, right? God wants to use you. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. God is listening and he's watching. God wants to sometimes just stand back and watch his children work through stuff. I always love the story of Moses when Jethro tells him he's been judging improperly. Moses is driving himself crazy, trying to judge everybody for the entire day. Jethro rolls up on him and says, uh, son, this is crazy. <laughs> you need to appoint judges. <laughs> and only you handle the important stuff that your judges cannot handle. That came from Jethro. Now, I believe all good things come from God. Don't, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit didn't move upon Jethro. My point is, is that God did not verbally tell Moses this because he had Jethro to tell him. Meaning, family, God is still going to use our uniqueness in reaching the world for himself. So some of you out there are probably thinking, I have an idea, pastor, but it's crazy. I don't think anyone would use it. I want to hear it. Pastor, I've been thinking about this for the last five years. I haven't told anybody about it because I think they would laugh me out of the church. I want to hear about it. Pastor, I think I have this one gift. I'm not sure if it could be used in the church. I want to know about it. As long as Christ is the foundation and he is the source for all of our good things, we have freedom to be a little creative and to think outside the box. But if we do that without Christ being the foundation, we in some trouble. Hey, let's close out here. Let's close out here. So Jesus, Jesus tells them that he's going to do this and, uh, through Peter and tells them not to say that he's the Messiah. Then Christ begins to speak with them very personally about how things are going to go down. He says, listen, now that you guys know what you know, I want you to understand that I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer greatly, but don't worry. I'm going to rise in three days. Peter, who hears this, raises his hand at the back of the classroom, grabs Jesus by the arm, pulls him off to the side and says, I cannot believe after I just pronounced you as the Messiah, the son of the living God, that you would start talking about being, being, being crucified. How could you do this? Look at Bartholomew. He's crying. Jesus, do better. Do better. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. No one will ever lay a finger on you. No one's ever going to torture you. You cannot die. And Peter, who Jesus says he would give him the keys. Peter, whatever he loosed on earth would be loosed in heaven, and whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. This same Peter who has the keys. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter, just a breath ago, is speaking because the Father has revealed something to him. Now he's saying, get thee behind me, Satan, in verse 23. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Verse 24 says, whoever wants to be my disciple must do what? What family? They must... Deny themselves, take up their cross, 
and follow me. Wow. Well, I was just feeling pretty pumped up, weren't you? We have the keys, we can loose, we can bind. The gates of Hades will not prevail against us. We're on the offense. It doesn't matter if we're in, in the territory of the enemy. We believe that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We're strong now. I'm, I'm, I don't know about you. I'm ready, I'm ready to go until this moment. What happens, family? What happened to Peter? Something happens to us when God begins to bless us. Something happens when God begins to pronounce blessings on us and promises. Something happens when God continues to anoint us with more gifting. We become more self-assured, more self-reliant, and more like the devil. Some of you, including myself, can't handle everything that God wants to give us. It would go to our head and we would end up serving a new master. Look at what I did. Look at what this church did. Do you know how many people gave for this project? Do you know how many, do you know how many gifted people we have, or how many gifted musicians? It goes to our head. And this is why family, listen to me, this is why God's anointing is not a one-time anointing. Us hearing the spirit of God is not a one-time thing. We must constantly be plugged in, constantly in tuned, constantly picking up our cross, constantly denying ourselves. This is not something that happens for a moment and that's it. Well, I've decided to follow Jesus. He says, no, if you wanna come after me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. The same invitation that was given to Simon Peter at the beginning, follow me and I will make you fish of men is the same invitation Jesus is giving him in this moment even after he pronounced Christ as the Messiah and the son of the living God he's still making mistakes just because God blessed you in in abundance last week doesn't mean you are not fitting yourself for a fall can I make this a little bit more personal just because God has given you a revelation and a light Seventh-day Adventist. Doesn't mean you can't drop the ball. We are the last day church, are we? Well, he said we are, like 200 years ago. What have we been doing since? Oh, but he would never take that away from us. Yeah, Moses thought the same thing, and then he didn't get into the promised land. Don't you think for a second that you are so good, so perfect, so, so, so prophesied about that God can't say, I'm going to give this to another. We must be daily denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following the Savior. Amen? God can bless us with a windfall of money tomorrow. He could, if he wanted to, he could have angels come and renovate our restrooms, right? God can do, he, he could give us everything today. He did this for Israel. And what did they do? You're not so good that you can't fall. So we take up our cross, we deny ourselves, and we follow Jesus, amen? For whoever wants to save their life, will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Church family, I believe God has given us a wonderful task to partner with him. Jesus is the foundation. But he's given you the keys. Christ is the car, but he's given you the keys. He's inviting you to partner with him, to be co-laborers in this beautiful mission to share with the world the good news. There are no bad ideas. Let's throw everything against the wall. Let's see what, let's see what sticks.
but it will take you, church family, each one of you individually, being willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. But I was voted as elder. Yeah, that was, that was a year ago. That's what they saw in you a year ago. What have you been doing since? I was voted in as your pastor. In order for me to remain your pastor, I must continually deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus. There's someone here today. There are certain commitments you've made in your life and you felt like you made them and you did your best and didn't work out. Some of you that are still resting your laurels on past success and you realize that in this moment though, in this moment though, there really hasn't been any self-denial. You really aren't picking up your cross and truly following Jesus. You believe that he's the son of God, but you don't act like he's the son of God. You don't walk like he's the son of God. You don't, you don't live like he's the foundation of your life. Who do men say I am? If Jesus is God, that should be transformative. If that's where you are today and you wanna see a revival in your life, you wanna keep moving forward, you wanna, you wanna deny yourself anew. As Paul says, being crucified daily, it's a daily experience plugging me into Christ. I'm not giving up on you, Lord. If that's where you are, I want you to pray with me right now. Father God, you, you know those who are in this sanctuary that need to fully give themselves to you. Oh, I know they said they did. That was last week. This is an invitation that is fresh and new. We are living with the gates of Hades all around us. So we must constantly be fortified. We must be constantly equipped. We must be constantly ready. Just because the Spirit of God filled us last week doesn't mean we're open to be filled today. So Father, we come here again willing to be broken on you, the rock of ages. Break us so that you can mold us and fill us. Father, we carried a, cra a cross last week, but we haven't carried our cross this week. Lord, place it upon our shoulders so that we can move forward. Whatever you ask us to do, we will do because you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And your anointing is fresh as the dew in the morning. Father, the reason why we haven't been able to pick up our cross in the last several months or this last several years is because we haven't been filled with you. We haven't been resting on you. So Father, we choose to do that now. Thank you for being the rock of ages. Thank you for trusting us with the keys and the task that we must deny and carry every day in Jesus name